DJ Shannon spinning those tunes. Great tunes. I thought you were going to play that. You lost that loving feeling again. That's like our go to song. <laughs> oh, man. I messed up. What happened? Maybe we can. Did you lose that, that loving one. feeling? Is that why? <laughs> you lost that. We're going to have to bring that back the next time you guys are together. Yeah. We got to watch. Wes is going to start singing it now. Oh, man. Okay, well, I am going to start by introducing these lovely people. I know when uh, these three get together, you're going to learn a lot, but we're also going to have fun. Today, they're talking about pulling high conflict court cases into the collaborative process. So uh, first, I'm going to start by introducing Carrie Heinzel. Carrie is the founder of Fairmore Family Law Financial Solutions. Fairmore offers independent fact-based financial analytics and settlement insights to the individuals and couples working through separation and divorce. Carrie is an active collaborative process trainer, co-teaching the introductory program for new collaborative professionals and advanced level trainings for seasoned practitioners. She sits on the board of directors for York and Durham Collaborative Practice and is the president-elect of the OACP. Carrie has taught statistics, research methodology, and psychology at college and university levels. In addition, Carrie has presented at conferences for the Ontario Association of Collaborative Professionals, Family Dispute Resolution, Institute of Ontario Annual Conference, and the International Academy of Collaborative Professionals. Thanks for joining us, Carrie. Oh, Next, we have Jared who is a partner at Gemmel Johnston Jeffries PC, where he practices primarily in family law, specializing in litigation, collaborative, and traditional settlement work. Jarrett also offers services in wills and estates and real estate. Jarrett is the president of the Kawartha Lakes Victoria Halliburton Law Association and an executive on the board of for the Kawartha Collaborative Practice. He has acted as a director for the Children's Services Council and spoken at several provincial, national, and international collaborative conferences and seminars. And he is passionate about getting his clients the best result poss possible with the, less, the least amount of financial, mental, and emotional damage, whether in the boardroom or the courtroom. Thank you for joining us as well, Jarrett. And Russell, um, we've all met before, so I'll pass things over to you. Get at it. I think this first slide is the quote that you love. Carrie, what we got here? Absolutely. Happy Friday, everyone. That's always the starter of everything, especially on a Friday. I hope everyone's having a great time uh, with the summit so far. This is one of my favorite quotes quote, because I actually fully and completely believe that in the long history of humankind, those who learn to collaborate and improvise will effect, uh, most effectively have prevailed. And I think we see that time and time again in collaborative practice that this should be our mantra and everything that we follow when people are working together. They absolutely have the best results and the best separation agreements and their families flourish after this process is over. So that is part of the reason why I love this quote so much. Runaway Train is one of my favorite. We did this five, six years ago. <laughs> Jerry says like pulling a dust car off a classic car, dust cover off a classic car, but it's true. You know, we've got a lot of flack when we pr first proposed this. Uh, we're still getting a bit of flack, but um, it's working. And if we can get high conflict cases out of the court system, uh, it's certainly worth it. So let's do go to our first poll and get a get a, a get a sense of what our audience is thinking. Are parties who are already who are already have an active court file allowed to proceed collaboratively? Uh, once or do they have to stay in court? So we'll give everybody a minute to answer this poll question. I just want to say I thought Brian, Carolyn, and Michelle did a great job with our uh, first presentation on opening more files. I love the tip. And that was Brian's wife in the video. I don't know if you're watching, but uh, Nicole got roped into uh, doing that recording. But I love his tip about writing the email to your client designed for the spouse, right? Just introducing the process to the, the other spouse in a very friendly way. Because as lawyers, we forget, you know, our letters showing up at somebody's door can be quite a nerve wracking experience and uh, really set them into fight or flight mode. Uh, so doing this, you know, nuanced email, just sort of slowly introducing the process. I thought was a great tip. I don't know if you saw that, Carrie, or not, but or Jared, do you do that from time? I to did. Time? 
I, but I always took the lawyer's letter of going to the spouse, kind of the same as receiving a letter from the CRA. Nothing good is ever in there. <laughs> There's no more refunds. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> nothing ever good is in the CRA letter. No. Your penalty this week is X, but do you do that too? You, you yeah. Know, yeah, yeah. The, the, closing? the introductory email or introductory letter is huge, right? And whether it's yeah. directed to the other party or to your client, I think doing the email to your client in a more casual way is an excellent uh, technique. Uh, but but it's funny because people, spouses pick up on things that they, they deem to be aggressive or have a heavy tone, even when you don't mean it to have that tone. So putting a very light uh, ec explanation email out to your client and letting them show their, their ex-spouse is a great, great way to do that. But we try to be as soft as we can in our opening uh, letters to, or, or emails uh, to the other party, yeah. That's great tip. Okay, so let's see what our audience is thinking. Uh, thank you for participating in the polls today. We're gonna do some polls throughout today's program. Um, do they have to work? Are they allowed to proceed collaboratively? Never, not a very big one. Yes, can opt out of the court system, 71%. Uh, only with CP trained professionals, so we're gonna get into that 13%. Only leave, with leave of the court and judge. And we're gonna actually talk about how you notify your case management judges if you're coming out of court, whether you withdraw or dismiss it or keep it active. So we're gonna give you some tips on that. Okay, so collaborative versus Court. What are we talking about here? So we're going to take a look at our next slide. So court collaborative is, you know, we've heard Brian talk about it this morning, Michelle, Carolyn, focus on goals and interests, family focus, problem solving, a fair degree of accountability. Uh, court, we're taking positions, uh, process focus, rules based system, blaming, it can be exhausting, financially draining as well, and it can take two, three years. I think now that we're rolling out of the pandemic, uh, we're setting court cases uh, in March. I don't know about you, Jared, but you know we're six, seven months away just to get get a hearing date. Um, so a lot of delay. Um, mm -hmm. But let's just suppose we get these one of these high conflict cases coming in your office, and opposing counsel has collaborative training. You know we've got a golden opportunity here, right, Carrie? Oh, absolutely. I always felt that with collaborative, that if you're collaboratively trained and the person on the other side is also collaboratively trained, I kind of feel like you almost have a duty to say, listen, we can look at this collaboratively and let's see where we can get. Um, let, let's do this because I think it's really important that everybody's looking at what is the best interest of the family here. And I think collaborative does it beautifully. And this is a great opportunity to stop this runaway train, right? Pull them Absolutely. out of the system. Um, usually what I ask when I get a high conflict case um, to my office, I'm saying, okay, why are we in court, right? What is court offering that collaborative doesn't? And very rarely, unless you have one of these vexatious litigants that will stop at nothing, very rarely does anybody need to be in court in my opinion. But um, what would your take on this be, Jared? Yeah, absolutely. I think we've all had these files where it, it originally went into court for one issue. There was one reason why it started in court. And once that one issue is sort of addressed, uh, the 17 other issues, they don't need to be in court. So Russ, you and I have had lots and lots of files like that where uh, we were able to pull it out of court uh, and, and stop that runaway tra train successfully right. pulled into collaborative. So uh, absolutely. It's usually just one reason why it got put into court originally and, and mm -hmm. pull it out, put it into collaborative. Mm -hmm. All right. So we're going to give our audience seven easy steps to do this. Carrie, you want to take the lead on this? Absolutely. And uh, I love this because it is seven easy st steps to do this. So one of the first things you have to do is everybody has to talk. So lawyers, you got to talk to each other and you got to say, you know what? I think we're gonna better serve our clients outside of court. So can we agree to talk about doing the collaborative process? It starts with you guys. I think you guys probably have heard Brian Galbraith say it a million times. Who does collaborative start with? It starts with me. And it absolutely is that way when we're pulling something out of court. So that's one of the things we wanna look at. The next thing, since you guys have now agreed that you're gonna pull everything out of court, then you have to tell the court what you're gonna do. 
you have to say, hey, we're going to try something different here. We're going to try and bring it out of court. And I don't know about you guys, but a lot of the judges that we have now are collaboratively trained. And I have yet to hear one that says, wow, that's a really bad idea. So if anybody knows of any judge that's saying pursuing it this way is a bad idea, please let us know because I've never heard it. <laughs> They're happy to get the matter off their docket. They don't want to be. It's like, oh, one more, one less thing I have to do with that. Right. Files this big, they got to read every night, and if that's one less file they have to worry about. Um, yeah, you're doing a favor. Absolutely. Now, the other thing that we want to do sometimes when we're pulling something in a court, we may have somebody that's going, oh, you know, I'm not sure about this. I'm really nervous, or we have this one issue that still really needs something else going on with it. And we really want to talk to that judge. So something that we want to look at maybe is amending that collaborative agreement. And we're going to talk about that later, about things that we might want to amend in a collaborative agreement. And for all you naysayers about, oh, I'm not sure about that, we're going to talk about that as well. Um, bring in your team. You know, having that family professional on board, board is great for diffusing some of the emotions that have happened and have kind of been inflamed while they're in court. So that family professional being able to get into the communications and even on the parenting side, let's get them in there, let's go. I always say a good family professional is wonderful for families with kids because one of the things they do is they're giving parents kind of a roadmap on parenting, which none of us thought when we had our kids, at least I didn't get my owner's manual when I took my kids home from the hospital. I don't know about you guys, maybe times have changed and you get one now. Certainly didn't happen when I had mine. Um, also, when you're bringing in the team, bring in your financial professional at this point as well. A lot of times you're still in court because you're arguing about money. Your financial neutral is that lovely neutral person that's gonna look at things differently. We're not gonna keep the arguments going. We're gonna bring them down. And one of the things your financial neutral is good at is rebuilding trust, especially around money. When all of this is happening, you guys are going to have some great meetings. And of course, we're going to reach settlement, which is fantastic. Your, your separation agreement can be turned into a court order. And then we have fulfilled all of the client's goals and interests, and they are moving forward with hopefully a much more cohesive family going forward. And I'm seeing some questions coming in about the fundraising we're doing for women of domestic violence. Brian, thank you for your donation. Carrie, I see you just donated. Oh, you froze. We have over 140 people here. If everybody kicks in a little bit, we're going to hit our target. We're at 6,500, 3,500 more to go. So thank you, everybody, who continued to donate. All right, so withdrawing from the court proceeding, this is how you do it. I'll take step one. Communicate with the case management judge, carry references. So oftentimes they'll tell the court that we're gonna to try to resolve matters collaboratively. Um, then that gives you some options. The judge usually, every time I do it, says, what do you need from the court, right? And so Jared, what do we do? You know, we've got the case management judge's permission, uh, number of options, withdrawal, dismiss, keep it going, what's the next step? And this is really fact dependent, and this is where the resistant lawyer sometimes comes into play. But I'm asking the other lawyer to suspend court or put court on hold or adjourn signy die. Sometimes it's really dependent on how resistant they are. So if you're trying to convince the other lawyer, look, we've we've dealt with that one issue. We let's pull this into collaborative. Let's stop the runaway train. Sometimes what's required, depending on how hesitant or how resistant the lawyer is, maybe we just need to suspend court. And, the, and as Russ said, the judges are going to be delighted. If you just like if you say to them, we're going to go mediate, you know, the judges are going to be happy, You're like go for it. So you can either adjourn, adjourn it, sign you die, uh, just put it off indefinitely, suspend court, whatever you want to do. Ideally, you're going to withdraw. But sometimes when the other lawyers resistant or the other parties resistant to do that, to pull it into collaborative, sometimes what you'll, you may end up having to do is just suspend or put on hold. And sometimes there's reasons for that. Sometimes there's limitation issues or sometimes there's, uh, you know, we want to keep it in court to get the divorce eventually or something like that. But ideally, you're going to have that conversation with the other lawyer and you're going to be able to pick what fits. Ultimately, if you're getting it out of court and proceeding collaboratively, that's the end goal. So that's great, but you just may want to have that good discussion on whether you completely withdraw uh, or whether you just suspend. Yeah. Great I found 
judges in Central East have been so accommodating, and I'm sure you've seen this, Jared. The judge will say, okay, no problem. Uh, just contact the trial coordinator, arrange a phone call with me if you need me for anything else. Uh, and you can get like a 8.30, 9 a.m. call before the court starts if there's an administrative issue, a limitation period issue. And because they'll go, they'll bend over backwards to accommodate this is because this is exactly what judges want to see our result uh, disputes resolved privately outside of the court system is under a lot of strain right now, but a lot of backlog. So, so number three, Carrie, what else do we yeah. need to know? Yeah, and, and we've touched on this a bit already. Your judges are just so much happier with their lighter dockets. I don't know anybody that says, gee, I'm really upset because my workload didn't increase. And everybody gets a little bit happier when that workload can go down a little bit. And you know what? There are so many judges now that are collaboratively trained. I just heard about at the ICP conference, you know, a couple more judges that were, you know, collaborative lawyers are like, going, I can't do files with this person anymore. I'm so upset. But then on the other side, they're like, wow, what, what a great thing if they're going onto the bench and they have that collaborative training. And one of the things we're seeing with neutrals is we're seeing a lot more judges saying, you're going to go and see a neutral to do this. So they're bringing in those collaborative principles anyways. So even if you want to be a litigator, you need to have collaborative training. You need to know what's going on because your judges are applying them and it makes you better lawyers. And the revisions to the Divorce Act require parties and their lawyers to explore uh, out-of-court resolutions before coming to court. Oftentimes, your case management judge will say, what have you done to resolve this? Or, yeah. or if there's a mediation uh, or dispute resolution provision in the agreement that you're trying yeah. to change, have you followed these provisions? And if you haven't, they're going to kick you out of court. They're going to say, well, go do that first and come back and see me after you've actually talked to each other. Yeah. Um, but let's run a poll because this is this next poll illustrates a problem and a lot of objections I hear from collaborative lawyers, especially when we're talking about runaway trains, high conflict cases. Sometimes the other lawyer doesn't have the training and they're really reluctant to take a collaborative approach. So if a so the, the poll is if a professional only wants to proceed on a small C, we hear this a lot, collaborative basis. Should this suggestion be considered a red flag or um, a sign of a possible problem, right? And this really jumps up when the other lawyer has collaborative training, right? You know, I'm mm -hmm. going to do small c. Uh, so they're not going to sign their participation agreement. They're not all in. No, that sends up a lot of red flags for uh, the purists who want to do it properly. And we're, we're talking, well, maybe a hybrid can work today. And we're going to explain why. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see what our audience thinks about this poll question. We'll get everybody another moment or two. Okay, let's see what our results are. Small C collaborative. Red flag, yes, 14%. No, 3%. Depends on whether they worked on a CB team. That's true, right? Yeah. You start to build trust and relationship. Uh, it depends on how small C is defined. Good point. Are we going to do the participation agreement? Are we going to do an amended participation agreement? Or we're just going to pretend to be collaborative, right? Uh, no, as long as everyone is properly trained and execute a standard CP agreement, 27%. Um, okay. So, Jared, what do you think of these small C approaches? I'm sure you hear it all the time. Yeah, it, it, you know what, if, if they get, if the clients get to the end result and they get a separation agreement, it's good for the family. I mean, that that's great. Where you run into trouble is when you're sort of on the fence of, of pulling it out of court and doing collaborative yeah. versus if there's that threat of motion or that threat of, well, if you don't agree to this during a collaborative meeting, I'm just going to go back to motions court next week. It's not going to work. The, the, the clients need to be committed to the process and they need to be committed to the principles of the process. So I'm a big fan of if you're going to pull it out and do it collaboratively, do it collaboratively. Um, you know, at the end of the day, if if it works and they get to that end separation agreement, great for the family. But but I'm, I, I'm a big uh, proponent of do it the right way, pull it out, sign the participation agreement and, and do it collaboratively. Gary, have you ever run into these small C approaches? We do run into small C approaches quite often. And you know what? I'm not against doing small C. 
Um, and part of the reason is, is that, you know, even the great Stu Webb has talked about the difference between small C and big C collaborative. And he says, it doesn't really matter as long as you get people talking and being collaborative together. It's about getting them out of the court and actually working together. So I kind of look at things that way. I also believe that, you know what, if we can get them doing something and working from on the same side of the table, looking at the problem together, I think it makes a really big difference. So for me, I look at and go, you know what, let's put into our, our agreements as we're amending things, or maybe we need to put down some ground rules that say, hey, these are the ground rules that we're going to use as we're going through this. And you can't be threatening going to motions court or anything else because it's not part of our ground rules. So there's all sorts of ways you can work the small C so that you're actually getting the big C, but it may be something that your client needs in order for them to commit to the process so that they have a sense that I'm being heard and I'm going to be okay because people are listening to me from the very beginning. And maybe the other lawyer doesn't have training. And that's when you do the small C. Stu Webb, just by for background, is really the godfather of CP. He started in Minnesota and uh, a great, great uh, person. Okay, so bringing in the team. Usually if I'm pulling a high conflict case out, I want to have the full team of at least a financial professional. We want to take a look especially if this is a case that um, has been in litigation for two years and it's just ending up on my desk. And oftentimes I explain collaborative to these clients and they say, nobody told me this was an option two years ago. I would have done this instead of going to court. But I bring in a financial professional to go through and check to see if the data is correct, if the calculations were done properly, net family property statement, financial statement, everything that we would need. Usually bring in a family professional. This is essential if it's high conflict. Um, it's usually the emotions and the power dynamics that um, are affecting the conflict. And we're gonna talk a little bit later about extended teams, and bringing in additional professionals, legacy planning, corporate lawyers, tax lawyers, depending on the composition of your, of your, uh, your, your clients. We'll also have a topic after this one about uh, saving the golden goose. So these are families who have businesses that they operate, often family businesses with adult children working in it. And we're going to talk a bit using Excel teams in that setting. But power and neutrality, what do we want to be mindful of here, Carrie? You know what? The, I always say that, you know, when one person says something, if so, for example, if one spouse is saying something to the other, it's coming off of poisoned lips. They're not going to listen. They're not going to hear it. They don't want to hear it. And that goes for your lawyers as well, too. So if you are a husband's lawyer and you're saying something to wife and to wife's lawyer, as far as they're concerned, it's poisoned. Um, everything, though, that comes off a of neutral's lips seems to be a little bit of sugar sweet. So it's a little, taken a lot better. They're listening to it. We have no skin in the game. We are completely neutral. I'm looking, for example, as a financial neutral, I'm looking at things going, what does it say? What does it look like? What does it mean? And then we're coming up with creativity from there. You know, so often we hear from somebody saying, you know, I've got the perfect solution. And I've told many clients over the years, you know what, you may very well have the perfect solution. But if you say it, it's off the table because they're not going to listen to you. Tell me what you think the perfect solution is. And it might be it, but if it's coming off of my lips, it's going to be better received all the way around. And we're giving credibility to whatever is coming out. We're saying, we have looked at it. And you know, so many times we end up with people saying, I really don't want my spouse seeing this visa statement, or I don't want them knowing about this or the other thing. It says a lot when uh, somebody can go back to the other client and go, I've seen it. It's okay. Or I've seen it. Hey, legal counsel, we have an issue here. It makes a difference. So that neutrality, oh, and here's the other fun part, is we can say stuff that the lawyers can't. Um, so that makes it kind of fun too. <laughs> so getting people one on our, side. One of our case studies, um, my client, uh, I don't want to dive too deep into it. Actually, let's run our poll and then I'll tell the story with the client. Um, so next poll, name a reason why a court would need to be involved in collaborative files. So a lot of the objections we get when we do this presentation is, 
you're not a purist. You can't tamper with the CP agreement. It, the main goal is not to go back to court. Uh, so we're asking, why would a court need to um, stay involved? And let's see what our audience thinks. And I also just got a notice. I want to thank Annabelle, who just donated to the Brigio Center uh, to support women who are uh, victims of domestic violence. So thank you, Annabelle, for your support today. Okay, so this particular case will be quick because we want to keep moving. And you know the case, Carrie, and I think uh, I've talked about it with Jared. My client was a teacher in a small community. Husband had her charged with uh, assault. She was removed from the home. Kids stayed in the home with dad, took her two years, about a year and a half to resolve the criminal charge without a conviction. Um, and they were in family court when I got the case, two years in. And she was pissed, right? She got charged, her reputation's ruined, she hasn't seen her kids for two years. You can understand why. So when I said, let's do it collaboratively, <laughs> you know, the other lawyer goes, well, you know, this as high conflict as you can get. But we did. And we brought in a financial professional and we brought in a business valuator. The husband owned the, the own business and the wife was sure, you know, cash transactions, running personal expenses through the business, hiding assets. And she didn't trust anything she had said, he had said because it was gone because of the charge and the rest of it. But what the neutral did was listen to what her concerns were, investigated the general ledger, went through all the data, and said, yeah, there is some cash, there is some personal expenses, and we grossed it up. But slowly we began to build up trust and credibility where, because it was coming from the neutral and not the husband's lawyer, she was able to accept the data and we ultimately resolved the case. But that just is one example of the power of neutrality. Any comments on that particular case, uh, Carrie? You know what, it was for me, I really enjoy watching transformation. So watching someone who um, has just complete anger and distrust for that, watching that flip over to not so angry anymore, but all of a sudden really getting into it going, oh, and saying, you've seen it, you're okay with this, you're, you're okay with it, and, and being able to say to them, like, wholeheartedly, yes. And then watching their entire body language just relax. And yeah. it made everything else so much easier to resolve after that. On, on that point, I, when, whenever you're struggling trying to sell the involvement of, of a financial neutral, that power of neutrality, a line I always use with the clients is, the sky's blue. I, you're telling me the sky's blue. I can tell your ex-spouse the sky's blue. They're not going to believe me, but they're going to believe Carrie. Carrie can <laughs> that the sky is blue. So that's why you need that power of neutrality. It's because you wrote that nasty letter on your letterhead. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> like from day one, right? That threatening letter. Too aggressive again. <laughs> yeah. I'm just right. finding that because I was more likable than Jared. That's what I thought. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, that's true, though. <laughs> um, but Jared is pretty charming. That's right. true. That's let's true. See what our, let's see what our audience is thinking here. So do you need a court? If it's truly CP, no, never. Um, unique area law, 11%. To obtain a final order, yeah, you know, that, keep that in mind. You're going to get an agreement. You may want a divorce order or an order in accordance with your agreement, or you may need an order to direct certain uh, administrators or other people to divide assets. That's a, a great point. Uh, to deal with urgent matters or limitation period, 34%. We often think, forget about that, right? When we're in the collaborative process, there's still limitation periods running. And not everybody comes to us, you know, two weeks after separation. They might come to us 18 months or four or five years later. And then you got to think, okay, are we going to miss a limitation period here? Okay, recognizing that impasse happens, well, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go to court. Um, but Jared, what is this hybrid approach? Um, what are you proposing that our audience consider? Yeah, I, th I think we have to be open-minded with the files where there, there can be a lot of merit in using a hybrid approach. Uh, so an example is a file I had recently where they started collaboratively, but they were living under the same roof and it was a toxic environment and police were being called almost on a weekly basis. 
That matter went into an urgent conference with the judge. The judge ordered one of them to go live with their parents down the street. They ended up resolving two weeks later every other issue, property, financial support, everything else was settled within the collaborative process. And then when the, when the case management judge checked in with the lawyers a few weeks later and we told the judge everything got resolved in the collaborative process, he was ecstatic. And, and he commented, just getting that one order, just having to dip into court to get that exclusive possession and get them out under the same roof, neither one of them was going to budge. They had it in their head. They had to stay under the same roof. So they wanted to proceed collaboratively and they wanted to work together with those principles, but they just needed the judge to do to, to one thing, make one order. And then they ended up resolving everything else so smoothly because that one thing had been put to bed. So that's a good example of how a hybrid approach can be extremely effective when it comes to self-helping behavior or limitation periods or urgency, or there's just one issue at a 17 that you just need the power of the red sash. Uh, Russ, you and I have experienced on dozens of files, sometimes being able to go back to our collaborative clients and say, hey, we were just up at court today on one of our litigation files and we ran this issue past the judge. This is what the judge's opinion was. Yeah. We take that opinion back to the collaborative process and the clients are getting the benefit of a judge's opinion within the collaborative process. So there's huge value there in, in working within these hybrid uh, approaches in, in my respectful opinion. You know, it's the best of both worlds, right? You get them out of court, but you get them to get all the tools of the collaborative process. And I'm going to talk a bit objections to um, client objections to this and, you know, and lack of trust in a moment, but I want to find out first what our audience is thinking. So uh, thank you everybody for participating in our polls. Uh, next poll is, is it appropriate to amend the CP participation agreement to permit parties and their lawyers to return to court? Boom, all the purists are now logging off our, our presentation saying you cannot do that. We <laughs> Believe me, I get it. I hear this all the time, but this is sometimes necessary. And yeah. I'm gonna explain why in a moment, but I'm, I wanna hear what our clients are thinking. And in my view, Carrie, the bar in Jarrett too, the collaborative bar in neutrals, um, professionals who are not lawyers. I think their thinking has evolved on this over the seven, several, last several years. And oh, uh, there's, there's a new normal. What would you say, Carrie? Oh, honestly, actually, since the start of the pandemic, and I think because they got so used to farming some stuff out, um, honestly, I have a large number of files right now that have come from the court that they are saying, we want you to, they, the clients have to retain you neutrally and that you have to work with them. So I'm working with them exactly the same way as if I was on a collaborative matter. And the thing that's really fun about it is that I'm actually getting the lawyers going, can we get this all done before we have to go back to court so we can just tell the judge that we're done? Yeah. Like they're excited about it. They're like going, we don't want to go back to court and tell the judge that we can get it done. Yeah. So you know what? It, it's happening. Your judges are demanding it, which is great. Jared, are you seeing an evolution in terms of thinking of CP professionals with respect to the hybrid approach you just talked about? Yeah, absolutely. It was just like, you know, like, as you said, a few years ago when no one thought of not doing a group collaborative meeting in person around a boardroom table, now Zoom is the new normal, right? And starting to work, you know, the pressure we're getting from the law society to, to offer unbundled uh, services, limited retainers, um, popping in and out between process models, I think everyone is being uh, progressive with respect to uh, ADR in general, but especially CP. I think we're seeing more and more of it and it's great uh, because it's getting files resolved. It's, it's, it's helping people and being too rigid it can actually you know, leave a family in a, in a vulnerable situation. I agree. And just one quick example. Um, we had a, a high conflict case wife was objecting she was saying um i don't think husband's going to meet his disclosure obligation so i don't want to do it collaboratively we sliced off that one issue the parties can go back to court to deal with collaborative that was the only that was the only 
reason why they were permitted to go back to court. Any other issue was no. We did it collaboratively. The issue never came up. We never went back to court. But that's all the wife needed to get over that fear, that objection. We dealt with it by severing it and by, you know, severing off that one piece and amending the CP agreement. It got them into the process. It got the case settled. And it was another high train, uh, you know, runaway train that was resolved. Okay, let's see what our poll results are. Um, well, five years ago, that never would have been 80 or 90%, right, Carrie? You agree, Jared? Yeah, it would have been 95, never. Yeah, and we would be getting calls after the presentation complaining, saying, what the hell are you guys <laughs> doing, teaching? But we're seeing an evolution, right? Yes, 13% 13, 13 yes, but only with certain issues, 44%. My favorite answer, if you've ever seen these events, is it depends. It's a bit of a cop it, but it really does depend, right, on what your clients, uh, where your clients are at. Okay, so modifying the CP agreement, um, I'm going to introduce just this, but um, we've talked about an agreement not to go to court, um, use of information in the collaborative process, new counsel, uh, there's waiting provisions. These are some of the things you're going to want to think about, these big topics. If you are going to take a high-conflict high case and do it collaboratively, whether it's small C, full C, modifying the agreement, or hybrid. So, Jerry, provisions regarding waiting periods. What do we need to think about here? You've got firsthand experience on this, I know, because I was on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this, this comes up a lot. Um, a lot of times uh, the other lawyer just thinks they need to rush it into court because of the limitation period. Um, you, you, you know, the, the standard participation agreement has a section on the parties committing to extending limitation periods if necessary within the collaborative process. It's good to put your mind to, to the wording in, in the PA if you're gonna be amending the participation agreement around that issue. Again, as you and I have experienced, there's no reason why you can't do a collaborative file, even though you're getting close to a limitation period. Start to consider tolling agreements, start to consider uh, amending the language to be very specific. It's all about communication with, within the professional team. How long do we want to extend? How long do we need to, to, to operate this collaborative file? What do the clients want? So just put your minds to that's not a barrier to doing collaborative process. Just, just put your minds to tolling agreement language, allowances for extensions of periods of time to allow the collaborative process to operate, which is gonna avoid one party rushing a court application in, which may get the other side's backup. Once that court application is rushed in and served, you know, now, now feelings are hurt and maybe you've missed an opportunity to right. do it collaboratively, right? So um, absolutely pay attention to that. Yeah. And I may have went out of order a little bit here, though. Agreement not to go to court, Carrie? Honestly, I, I think we've touched on this a little bit. You know, the standard participation agreement says that we won't go to court, we won't threaten to go to court or anything else. I think, again, we're going back to that. If you're pulling it out of court and somebody has reservations or us as a professional team, we end up looking going, you know what? We might have a situation here where we may have to talk to a judge put those parameters down and say, hey, listen, and you can add this to your agreement and say, listen, for these items, we will go back to court. And by the way, it's never going to be multiple. It might be one or two at best, but you know, put those right into your new agreement. Say, we will only go to court if, and then stick it in there, have it, so everybody knows this is the only time this, this comes up, that's when we're going to go. Otherwise, it's off the table. Yeah, yeah. All right, new legal counsel, Jared, what do we need to be mindful of here? Yeah, um, again, just putting your minds to, uh, obviously that's in the standard participation agreement as well, new counsel jump on board within the collaborative process, but if it's already started in court, whether the new lawyer has uh, is a litigator, whether they have the collaborative training, catering the language to allow for lawyers to come in or come out of the process, depending if it already started in court or isn't yet in court, but perhaps there's one or two issues that need to be addressed in court, whether the collaborative lawyers permitted uh, to come in and out of that collaborative process. Uh, again, it's all about communication. 
if there's one issue, the example we keep giving, if there's one thing that might need to get, go to court, you might want to amend this section a little bit to say whether or not uh, that the client requires a different lawyer to take that one issue to court or whether the collaborative lawyer who, who's a litigator as well is able to take that one issue into court. So just be careful around the language here. If you're using a hybrid approach, make sure that the PA itself doesn't preclude the collaborative lawyer for take, from taking that one issue uh, to, the, to the judge. And, yeah, this is an important point. If we're doing a hybrid and you're going to go back to court for a specific issue, this three or four section is of the standard PA that you want to amend. If you only do the one and don't get the next paragraph, somebody can object, say, well, this prevents you from going back to court. So you want to make the document consistent. So use of information, Jared, this is you, this has been a hot topic, I know, for some cases that you were involved in. Yeah. Um, and it's never fully understand exactly what information in the collaborative process can be used in court because of the language of the PA, uh, the participation agreement. But what do we want to think of when we're thinking about information? Yeah, this is this can be a very uh, touchy touchy subject. I was involved in a case where the collaborative lawyers got called to the litigation that ensued after, and the judge shut it down. The litigation lawyers wanted the progress notes admitted to the court proceeding. They wanted everything that was talked about in every single collaborative meeting before the court. And that was because there was uh, cross claims about failure to deal in good faith within the collaborative process. Everyone listening right now could, can feel some peace of mind because that got shut down. They were told that no, none of those collaborative meeting discussions are going to be uh, introduced at trial. But to, to Russell's example on the one case you, example. You got, you got dragged in the court. You didn't want to produce it. That's right. Yes. Um, in my view, an obtuse lawyer was trying to force this issue. That's right. And he did a judge with collaborative practice training. So. Yes, we got the right judge. <laughs> That's what happened. Great. Right? Quick, quickly shut that down. But yeah. uh, pay attention to this language because, again, to Russell's case example, maybe there's disclosure that you want to talk about that you want to be able to, to go to court just for that one issue. Say, say there's disclosure issues that you need to sort of sever from the collaborative process, dip into court, get an order on what disclosure, maybe third party records. That's a, that's a common one where you need to dip into court just to get a third party's records order or something to that extent. So again, you might want to modify this section of the agreement. The standard stuff is going to survive the collaborative process, right? Appraisals, financial statements, things like that. But this is where you want to be careful and this is where you want to have that discussion within your professional team is there certain pieces of financial information that may need to dip into court to, to be put before a judge to get that disclosure order and then we'll come back to the process. So if you're going to modify it all, be very careful around this section and what is going to be uh, provided beyond the collaborative process to the court. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of pitfalls. You want to be as clear as possible. Let's just go back to that last slide, slide for a second. Carrie, um, you're really you know, the gatekeeper of information for the CP process, at least the financial data, NFP statements, SAGs, um, you know, clients' notes and business records and all the rest of it. What's your take on use of information? What's your tip for our audience? Um, use, of, use of information, honestly, I, this can be such a double edge. So one of the things is that there's so often we get like, then that family property statement is done. They've agreed to it. They understand it. You know, so many times where communication starts to break down and things get messy is when it's about how does it get paid? And that it's not so much what's in the documents about what the result is and, and how that happens. So the thing for me is always about like how do, like if this is the case and if everybody's agreeing that, listen, we already agreed to a net family property statement or we've already got certain things done. I'm always telling lawyers like, let's do an interim agreement. Like let's not lose everything that we've done so that at least there's something, if they have to, if everything falls apart, they have something they can take away with them. They don't feel like they've lost all of their money. I'm always kind of protective of people's money as they're going through this. It's so right. expensive <clears throat> and that this is the, biggest financial decisions they're making in their lives let's make it so that it's not a complete loss so if we can give them something and a lot of times just pointing that out or saying hey we can give you this and then you can take some of the information with you 
it really helps them along. And sometimes what I've seen is they turn around and go, you know what, we can figure this out. We don't need to, we don't need to leave. We don't need to go to court. We don't need to do any of that stuff. Let's stay and work it out. And I, and I think that goes to the part about impasse. It's normal. Yeah, I'm, sign, I'm signing off on the NFP statement, right? That yeah. works. You've yeah. got that. that Let's part. get them to so, do these things. I've seen a really effective tool uh, used more recently within the Cloudwork process where I had, a, I had a case where the, the police officer didn't want to provide their pension valuation. It's a common law relationship. They, only, they were going to put it into court, and then we stopped them and said, look, you can still proceed collaboratively. What if you provide the valuation within the Cloudwork process? So the PA was amended to say that the, the pension valuation would stay within the collaborative process. If the process broke down, it wouldn't be released for court. I've had that on other files where perhaps there's sensitive records that they don't want to proceed collaboratively. But if they do proceed collaboratively, you can have an agreement that those records will stay within the collaborative process. And that might get it through the door into the collaborative process, whereas otherwise it would have ended up into court. So th those are some tools that can be used as well, uh, sort of on the flip side to, to keep it within the collaborative process. But it all comes down to the same thing. It's all about communication and being clear in those communications with your professional team and with your clients. So often we get into, you know, oh, my client's not going to like what I have to say. But it's honest and it's real and it's part of managing expectations, which is a massive part of all of our jobs. So let's make sure it's clear and concise. They're not going to like it for 15 minutes. That's okay. It's better than them not liking it for the rest of their lives. Yeah. And we had thank the audience for your questions. Keep them coming in. We're going through them as we as we're, we're getting them, and we're going to save some time for Q&A Q &A at the end. We did have a question that came in. How do you actually put the matter before the court, or do you simply seek judicial input? Well, the, there's sort of two parts to that question. The presentation today is runaway trains. So high conflict cases that are already in the court system. If you think you're gonna need judicial input on a specific issue, amend your participation in agreement to deal with that issue. So the collaborative lawyers can go see the case management judge. And we've given examples of how accommodating they can be. It could be by way of a conference, a telephone call through the trial coordinator, could be maybe a 14B motion for an example. And uh, we've had other cases that were not in court, but we wanted some input. Uh, I think Jared and I were on this <clears throat> and we were in chambers on a regular family court date dealing with regular litigation clients. And we just said to the, to the presiding judge, can we pick your brain for a few minutes? And we presented him with the legal issue we're having problems with in collaborative setting. There were no briefs. Uh, Jared and I just provided a brief factual background. And we were able to get an opinion based on what a judge would do, what that particular judge would do with that fact scenario. I don't know if you remember that case, Jared. Yeah. So here we're saving several thousand dollars. We're not commencing a court application. We're not filing an answer. We're just getting input from a, you know, a senior family court judge on a specific legal issue. Uh, and it was really quite effective. Do you have any comments about that example, Jared? Yeah, that was an excellent uh, use of resources. Our judges are so kind with their time when it comes to that. Now, the question may be, say the collaborative lawyer doesn't practice litigation, doesn't happen to be sitting up in the court right. on other matters. Of course, you would need to agree to maybe just do an application with that one issue. You'd have to start start an action maybe in that example if, you're, if your lawyers weren't already up there on other matters. Our judges in both Durham and Kortha Lakes are, are so kind with their time. We've been able to do that over the years and just sort of put an issue to the judge as an aside, take it back to the collaborative team. And that's been an effective strategy. So if you can do that, great. If you can't and you need to dip into court just to get a judge's opinion, you're probably going to have to amend the participation agreement to allow that one issue in an application to go to, go to court to, to answer that. And we talked about this briefly. This is the one I kind of shuffled the deck on. But one thing I want to identify, and Jarrett was speaking to this, you may want to think about the waiting period before you go to court or start a court action. The standard language is 30 days. If you're dealing with a high conflict court case, and Jared and I had, had a case like this, um, we were to set 
we had our first collaborative meeting scheduled. And one of the parents left the jurisdiction before the meeting started. So we haven't signed the, seat, the participation agreement yet and went to Alberta with the children. We needed to get an order. I'm not saying whose who's client was, but my client would never do that. Uh, <laughs> we needed to get an order for the return of the children. Children were returned very quickly. And um, then that parent said, well, let's try the CP process again. The parent who jumped the meeting and went out west. So obviously we had some concerns, right? Um, but we, we believed in the process. So what we needed to do was tighten the require this 30 day window, just in case the parent took off with the kids again, my client would need to go, you know, probably ex parte to court to get an order within four or five days for the return. 30 days would have been too long. So everybody agreed we're going to tighten this one window up. We weren't going to go to court other than the risk of flight and notice was going to be severely restricted uh, in terms of um, going to court because she had already demonstrated um, this conduct. So that was enough to gain enough trust in the process to bring them back in the collaborative setting and avoid, you know, thousands of dollars in motions and hearings and all the rest of it. Um, any comments on that particular case study, Jared? Yeah, that, that's an excellent example. And it's very important, just like drafting a separation agreement, put the language in, if you're going to modify the PA to allow for that, put in why, you know, this is the issue. There was, there was a mobility issue, or if another mobility issue arises, either party's able to put just that issue alone before, before the court. So, so cater it to the facts at hand, right? Talk to your professional team, talk to the clients, explain why you're modifying it. And in that, that's a perfect example that was necessary. We've had other ones where we've modified a little bit to allow, say it's an exclusive possession or one party has refused to sell a joint property for six years and by the time they walk into your office and that's a huge issue. You know, there, there's these one-offs, you know, a lot of times it's just one thing that you might need to pop into court. Uh, Self-helping behavior is another big one where if someone's, you know, withholding the children, maybe you want to start the collaborative process and amend that a bit to say if if either party withholds or, or overholds the other party's authorized to just put that issue before the court so those are great examples for us yeah so what you want to think of what is the objection right what is keeping these people in court and just like you drill down for goals and interests when you find out what the actual objection is usually it's not as big as the client thinks it is deal with it by amending the participation agreement and get them into the collaborative setting. But Carrie, not for everyone? Not for everyone. It is, there are real purists out there and what, and I appreciate them and everything else and they do work really great work and they work really hard. But I always wanna remind everybody that when we're doing collaborative, we are offering a concierge service. We are offering a service that is tailored to this specific family. Yes, there's a lot of forms that we use that are the same for everything. There's certain things that we do the same, but at the end of the day, every family is different. No two are like, never had I ever seen anything where something lines up exactly the same as for two families. So when I look at that, I say, listen, we need to do things. We need to be able to bend and be creative for the families that we are serving. And because of that, I'm like going, Love you for being a purist, but we have to keep an open mind and, and open our creativity up. So however we can do that, and again, it starts with communication. Also, for collaborative professionals, just think there's a whole market of potential clients sitting in courthouses. Yeah. And there's a whole bunch of families you can serve by getting them out of that process and introducing to collaborative. Absolutely. You know, you may need to be creative to get them out of the courthouse, but usually the result they're going to get in court is not going to be as good as the result they're going to get in a collaborative setting or as rewarding. Um, Everybody has said, you know, I want control over my life. I want to do this. Well, if you're in court, you have no control. Like, it's gone. 
And that yeah. at least this is a process where your clients are going to be heard. They're going to move forward. They're going to get to have their say and have other people consider what they're saying. You know, one of the things that we've done in recent years is for those people that are just like completely headbutting us, if we've changed the word participation agreement to process agreement, just so everybody knows it's the exact same agreement, except for it says process instead of participation, we have no problem getting people to sign that. And sometimes that's the tweak you need to make. That's how you have to adjust that agreement so that it says process rather than participation. And all of a sudden they're on board. It's amazing what language can do. Yeah, and I, I, I love using this prop and I'm gonna get it wrong, but you know, can you say, oh, this is you. And then, you know, this is how much your spouse knows about you. This is how much your family lawyer might know about you. This is how much your family lawyer might think is relevant. This is what they tell the judge and you keep folding it, right? This is what, and finally, you know, you get this little piece of paper. This is what the court's gonna look at when they're citing your case. Like it's crazy, right? And the judge is gonna have their own view of what's right and wrong. But in the collaborative process, you get to look at the whole page, right? Which is great. All right. Um, so Jared, you want to talk about this one? I know I had it, but I keep going on. I want to give you some face time. Um, talk about the over court burden court system, Russ, or sure. well, where are we at? This is what collaborative, this is what we're, we're, we're proposing can do with respect to these high conflict cases. Yeah, I mean, we, we've seen the success of it. it it's absolutely, we, the file that always comes to mind when, when clients or, or other lawyers ask about this is, Russ and I had this sad file where, where Russ's client was terminal um, mm -hmm. and Russ had to put it into court uh, because my client who hadn't hired me yet was not responding. And she was terminal, she was in the hospital and you know it was already started in court I got hired uh, last minute, called Russ. We immediately mobilized. Carrie was the financial professional on that file. The whole collaborative team went to the hospital and we did our collaborative meetings at the hospital around this, this lady's hospital bed. Um, and it was an excellent example of how quickly you can mobilize within the collaborative process versus court. Um, they, their, their needs never would have been served at court. We would have been begging and pleading for court time that wasn't there, wasn't available, and the lady might have passed before they reached any resolution, which would have caused a nightmare for that family. They had kids, they had estate yeah. issues, uh, properties. Um, so that's an ex excellent example of how there was a need to put it into court. Russ needed to put it into court before I got retained, but then there was a very easy transition, a quick transition to get it out of court. Um, and, and, you know, we, we keep, uh, talking about this, but the judges were more than happy to say, oh, geez, yes, that's what's going on. Please go collaborate. Um, mm. they wanted us to do that. I forgot about that case. It gives me goosebumps because my client would be taken off her pain med for the meeting. So she'd be lucid oh. and she was just waiting to die. Right. And so she struggled through it. We got the agreement signed, she passed away a few days later. Uh, but that's really the power of team, really the power of being flexible and doing a hybrid approach. Uh, that was a great example, Jared. I forgot about that. Shannon, welcome back. Thank you. We'll see everybody soon. Thanks, everyone.